I thought I would start with a little blast from the past. So I'll just hold this up. This is called a, a reporter. Now I don't open this camera very often because this part of it here is um, cardboard and leatherette. So you can imagine it's a little bit fragile. This is um, I think 1940s, this one, or maybe a little bit earlier. It's got a fixed lens on the camera. So not a zoomable one, and I'll explain the difference between those in a moment and show you if my tether works. And we, this is one you've probably never seen, apart from Amanda. <laughs> he's, I think he's actually used this one. This is a twin lens reflex camera. So you'll hear, you've often heard about single lens reflex or digital single lens reflex. This is the other version. And it's a little bit different. If it's going to let me open it today. There we go. Because you look down inside the, the mirror inside. So there's no mirror in these things. So I guess it's the earliest mirrorless camera, Ananda. <laughs> Um, but it does have prisms that help you see where the light is. And move on to the single lens reflex. Now we're still in film cameras at the moment, which is a bit deliberate. I do want to do them in order. Um, these ones, light comes in through the lens, bounces around in a little prism up here, and you see it in the viewfinder in the back. And it's got a lovely high resolution screen on this one too. Getting into the more modern varieties. This wasn't my first digital camera, but it's the same model as one of my first ones. So I actually threw that camera away a long time ago. And I found this one and thought, great, I'll have that. Um, so the, I've just got a question about how old the cameras are. So the, the Mamiya, that one's probably about 50 years old, I would think, somewhere in that range. The DSLR Mamiya is a, a late 60s, so probably, so the other one might actually be earlier. Um, this one was from 1991, I think, from memory. This is another old one. This is actually my favorite old one. This is a Japanese Futura S. So this style of camera is rangefinder. You probably won't see this in the meeting notes because I did actually forget one style. Um, in these ones, you don't look through the lens. You look through an eyepiece, which there's an eyepiece on the back and where you see out the front. So what you're looking at is very similar to what your lens sees, but not quite the same. And if you're capturing things close to the borders of your image, you have to be pretty careful so you don't lose any. Getting into some of the more modern stuff. So we've got our little point and shoot camera. This is a mirrorless one. It's a Fuji film. I don't know if you can see. There you go. You can sort of see me. <laughs> so it's a little... Fujifilm X10. I actually won this one in a competition, so I was kind of happy. <laughs> You've got a little baby mirrorless camera. This is a little Olympus. Very, very similar to the Fuji, except that you can take the lens off and put different ones on. Um, just out of interest, we'll cover... Um, pro glass and amateur glass in, in another session. I think it's actually next week. But these two lenses are essentially the same. One of them's amateur league, that one, and one of them's professional. The professional one, a lot better built, quite a different degree of brightness that you can actually get through this one, but still very, very similar. So there's nothing wrong with using this style.
this is my current beast and the one I hope to use for some of the demonstration. Later, you might know it's got a cable hanging out the back of it. Um, I want to tether this to show you the differences in some of the lenses. Um, we'll do mostly on lenses next week, but I will touch on them very briefly in here. Max is uh, probably going to be happy at the moment. Do you want to hold yours up, Max? So you can probably see. Yeah, Max's... so here's the, the Theta, uh, Theta Z1. That's a 360 camera. It's about a thousand US dollars. And this is great for taking street view photography for Google Maps. Yep. Oh, and if you want to learn more about that, you'll need to stick around for another week where we're going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a plug. Yes, indeed. We will be doing a session session on the 360. So this is its little brother. This is the original Theta. And somewhere around here, I've got a Theta V as well. But um, like I said, I don't actually know where that one is right now. I will need to find it. Now, there's one camera that we have. Actually, just, just in the comments, just curious, who here has taken a 360 photo, either with their phone or with a camera? Just write in the comments if you have taken a 360 photo. Just uh, Ollie was pointing out this camera takes a floppy disk, and yes, indeed it does. So who's seen a floppy disk? Who's old enough to have actually seen one? It also takes, this was the, I think this might have actually been the first flash memory. This was called the Sony Magic Gate Flash. Um, this one is, you're going to laugh at this, this is 16 megabytes. <laughs> a whole, and it still works amazingly the original flash had an issue that if you wrote to it more than about 10,000 times it died so um, while I do take that camera out in the occasional photo walk I don't use it much because I don't want to kill the flash because I can't replace it now there's one camera that we haven't talked about yet and it's probably the one that most of you have got so you've all got a phone camera this is probably the most common thing that contributes to maps, whether you've got Android or iOS, or possibly a Windows phone, if you're one of those crazy people. Don't think there's many of those left now that they've killed it again. But, um, or you could get into the new Huawei operating system, but we won't go there because it can't run maps. Um, but most of you have probably got one of these. The main difference between the different cameras is what you can do with them. So they all have one thing in common, they all take photos, they all make images, but they have some very subtle differences. The phones tend to have some really, really clever software. And this software is starting to appear in camera bodies now as well. It's often got um, some machine learning or a lot of people like to call it artificial intelligence, but I do prefer machine learning because that's what it really is. Um, software that makes your images better. So you may have noticed that there's a significant difference between the lens in a phone and in a camera. Even in a baby camera like this one, there's still a massive difference between the two of them. The phone lenses have come a long way. The phone sensors are very, very small. You should actually be able to see the sensor in there. So that thing that sort of shining a little bit blue and occasionally reflecting people's faces, um, that's the sensor. Well, it's actually a glass filter on top of the sensor, but the sensor's behind it. Uh, the sensor in that is in normal handheld photography standards, actually a fairly small one. It's called a micro four thirds, which means it's about that big. I won't go into the specific sizes of all of them because I don't want to get too confusing. But you can imagine that the, the sensor in here, it's only about that big, tiny little thing. So they have to rely on some smarts to make your pictures better. But you have to admit, if you look at the stuff that the latest phones do, and I don't care what your favorite brand is, they're all pretty good. Um, some of the stuff that they do now through that tiny sensor and that tiny lens is quite amazing. So the different kinds, when you're carrying them around, uh, might govern what you do. So if I'm going out on a photo walk, I'll generally take the big beast with me because this is versatile for me because it carries a nice zoom lens. It's got a lot of image stabilization, so I can do handheld images in almost complete darkness, which is something that the older 
DSLRs can't really do. Um, you People might have seen me talk about in the meetup post that I think the D in DSLR stands for dinosaur. There's two reasons for that. One is that flappy mirror inside. So when you actually take a picture and you're looking through the thing, there's a mirror that sits down and it reflects that image out of the lens up to your eye. When you go to take the picture, the first thing that happens is that mirror slaps up. That exposes the sensor that's behind it. And then you can take a picture. Some of those cameras do have a live view, which means the mirror is up when they're doing that. But most of the time, once that shot finishes, the mirror has to come down again. And all of that moving plastic and glass means that you're susceptible to a bit of shock when you take a photo. And that can lead to more blurry photos. Not having a mirror, I'm like this little beastie in the mirrorless cameras. And it doesn't really matter which mirrorless brand you use, they're all good. And all of the big brands have even brought theirs out now. They've given up. Even Canon and Nikon have given up and brought out mirrorless cameras finally, fairly decent ones. Um, those ones, you don't have so much shock because the only moving thing is the shutter and you can even turn that off. You can have an electronic shutter if you want to, but that has other considerations. Um, but you can also do some really amazing things. The Olympus one that I've got here um, has some really nice in-camera composite capabilities. And it's also got um, the ability to let you see the image as it's developing on the sensor, which is kind of good. So you could probably guess my favorite camera type.